Chapter One of the Book of This and That. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn. The Book of This and That by Robert Lind. Suspicion. Suspicion is a beast with a thousand eyes, but most of them are blind, or color blind, or askew, or rolling, or yellow. It is a beast with a thousand ears, but most of them are like the ears of the deaf man in the comic recitation, who, when you say whiskers, hears solicitors, and when you are talking about the weather, thinks you are threatening to murder him. It is a beast with a thousand tongues, and they are all slanderous. On the whole, it is the most loathsome monster outside the pages of the fairy queen just as the ugliest ape that ever was born is all the more repellent for being so like a man so suspicion is all the more hideous because it is so close a caricature of the passion of truth it is a leering perversion of that passion which sent columbus looking for a lost continent and urged galileo to turn his telescope on the heavens columbus may in a sense be said to have suspected that america was there and Galileo suspected more than was good for his comfort about the conduct of the stars. But these were noble suspicions, leaps into the light. They are no more comparable to the suspicions which are becoming a feature of public life than the energies of an explorer of the South Pole are comparable to the energies of one of those private detectives who are paid to grub after evidence in divorce cases. One might put it a good deal more strongly, indeed, for the private detective may in his own way be an officer of truth and humanity while the suspicious politician is the prophet only of party disreputableness he is like the average suspicious husband in the case of whom even when his suspicions are true one is inclined to sympathize with the wife for being married to so green-eyed a fool suspicion take it all in all is the most tedious and scrannel of the sins it would be folly of course to suggest that there is no such thing as justifiable suspicion. If you see a man in a tube lift with his hand on some old gentleman's watch chain, you are justified in suspecting that his object is something less innocent than to persuade the old gentleman to become a Plymouth brother. But the man of suspicious temperament is not content with cases of this sort. He is the sort of man who, if it were not for the law of libel, would suspect the Reverend F. B. Meyer of having stolen La Gioconda from the Louvre. His suspicions are like those of a man who would accost you in the street with the assertion that you had just murdered the President of the United States or that you were hiding a stolen dreadnought in your pocket. Obviously, there would be no reply to a man like this, except that he was mad. He has got an idea into his head, and it is his idea, and not the proof or disproof that the idea has any justification which seems to him to be the most important thing in the world. Suspicion, indeed, is a well-known form of mania. Husbands suspect their wives of trying to poison their beer. Friends suspect friends of planning the most extraordinary series of losses and humiliations for them. Nothing can happen, but the suspicious man believes that somebody did it on purpose. He is like the savage, who cannot believe that his great-grandmother died without somebody having plotted it obviously to believe things like this is to put poison in the air and it is not surprising to learn that the savage goes out and murders the first man he meets for being his great-grandmother's murderer in this manner civilized man is little better than the savage he knows a little more about natural laws and so he is not suspicious of quite the same things but his suspicions as soon as he begins to harbor them, swiftly strip off his civilization as a drunken man strips off his coat in order to fight in the street. He becomes Othello while the clock is striking. Straight away, all the world's his bolster. There is no creature on earth so innocent or so beautiful that he will not smother it in the insanity of his passion. Literature is to a great extent an indictment of suspicion. The ring in the book is an epic of suspicion and the blot on the scutcheon is its tragedy in the story of paolo and francesca again we are made feel that the hideous thing was not the love of paolo and francesca but the murderous suspicion of malatesta 
in this case it may be admitted there was justice in the suspicion but suspicion is so very loathsome a thing that even when it is just we like it as little as we like spying all we can say in its favor is that it is more pitiable men do not go spying because there is a fury in their bosoms but the suspicious man is one who is being eaten alive at the heart he wears the mark of doom on his sullen brows as surely as cain for such a man the sun does not shine and the stars are silver conspirators he is a person who can suspect whole landscapes he sees a countryside not as an exciting pattern of meadow and river bend and hills and smoke among trees but as an arrangement of a thousand farms with fierce dogs eager for the calves of his legs he can concentrate his affections on nothing beautiful he can see only worms in buds he can ultimately follow nothing with enthusiasm but will-o'-the-wisps to go after these he will leave wife and children and lands and he will dance into the perils of the marshes into sure drowning a lost figure of derision or pity according to your gentleness nor is it only in private life that suspicion is a light that leads men into bog holes suspicion in public life is also a disaster among passions englishmen who realize this must have noticed with apprehension the growth of suspicion as a principle in recent years suspicion is the arch calumniator that is why of all weapons it is most avoided by decent fighters every honorable man would rather be calumniated than a calumniator every sensible man too for calumny is the worst policy it is clear that while the public men of a country are prepared to believe each other capable of anything there can be no more national unity than in present-day mexico or than in poland before the partition it is the same with parties as with nations the reason why revolutionary parties are so rarely successful is that the members suspect not only everybody else but each other the more revolutionary the party is the more the members are inclined to regard each other not as potential garibaldis but potential traitors for much the same reasons criminal conspiracies seldom prosper crime seems to create an atmosphere of suspicion and cooperation among men who doubt each other is impossible but it is the same with every conspiracy whether it is criminal or not secrecy seems to awaken all the nerves of suspicion even when one is secret for the public good and the conspirators soon find themselves believing the most ludicrous things who has not known committees on which some man or woman will not sit because of an idea that some other member is in the pay of scotland yard the amusing part of the business is that this kind of thing goes on even in committees about the proceedings of which there is no need of secrecy at all and at which reporters from the times might be present for all the harm to man or beast that is discussed but there is a tradition of suspicion in some movements that serves the purpose of enabling many innocent people to lead exciting lives i once knew a man who spent half his time tying up his bootlaces under lamp posts he had an invincible belief that detectives followed him and he was never content till he had allowed whoever was behind him to get past scotland yard i am confident knew as little of him as it does of wordsworth but it was his folly to think otherwise and for all i know he may be going on with those slow but sensational walks of his through the london streets at the present day this is the amusing side of suspicion unfortunately it has also its base and mirthless side practically every bloody mistake i use the word not as an oath in the french revolution was a result of suspicion it began with suspicion of the girondins but suspicion of danton and robespierre soon followed suspicion is a monster that devours her own children manifestly no movement can succeed in which men believe that their friends are viler than their enemies but in every movement there are men who make a trait of suspecting the leaders in their own camp and the socialist movement is as much exposed to the plague as any other suspicion of this kind i think is a bitter form of egoism it is a trampling of the suspected persons under one's own white feet nor is it only in movements and in nations that suspicion plays havoc international suspicion is a no less costly visitor 
we live in a world in which every cup of tea we drink and every pipe of tobacco we smoke pays toll to this ancient and gluttonous dragon every year each country sets up huge altars of men and ships and guns to the beast but he is not satisfied he demands universal power and insists that we shall give all our goods to him except just enough to keep ourselves alive and that we shall not shrink even from offering up human sacrifices at a nod of his head perhaps some day a new st george will arise and release us from so shameful a subjection common sense seems to have as little force against him as an ordinary foot soldier against goliath we feel the need of some miraculous personage to put an end to our distress meanwhile one may hail as prophetic the continual organization of new knighthoods for the suppression of the dragon end of chapter one chapter two of the book of this and that this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn. The Book of This and That by Robert Lind. On Good Resolutions. There is too little respect paid to the good resolutions which are so popular a feature of the new year. We laugh at the man who is always turning over a new leaf as though he were the last word in absurdity, and we even invent proverbs to discourage him, such as that the road to hell is paved with good intentions this makes life extremely difficult for the well-meaning it robs many of us of the very last of our little store of virtue our virtue we have hitherto put almost entirely into our resolutions to ask us to put it into our actions instead is like asking a man who has for years devoted his genius to literature to switch it off on to marine biology nature unfortunately has not made us sufficiently accommodating for these rapid changes she has appointed to each of us his own small plot has made one of us a poet another an economist another a politician one of us good at making plans another good at putting them into execution one feels justified then in claiming for the maker of good resolutions a place in the sun Good resolutions are too delightful a form of morality to be allowed to disappear from a world in which so much of morality is dismal. They are morality at its dawn, morality fresh and untarnished and full of song. They are golden anticipations of the day's work, anticipations of which, alas, the day's work too often proves unworthy. Work, says Emile somewhere, is vulgarized thought. Work i prefer to say is vulgarized good resolutions there are no doubt some people whose resolutions are so natively mediocre that it is no trouble in the world to put them into practice promise and performance are in such cases as like as a pair of twins both are contemptible but as for those of us whose promises are apt to be himalayan how can one expect the little pack mule of performance to climb to such pathless and giddy heights are not the himalayas in themselves a sufficiently inspiring spectacle all the more inspiring indeed if some peak still remains unscaled mysterious but resolutions of this magnitude belong rather to the region of daydreams they take one back to one's childhood when one longed to win the football cup for one's school team and if possible to have one's leg broken just as one scored the decisive try Considering that one did not play football, this may surely be regarded as a noble example of an impossible ideal. It has the inaccessibility of a star rather than of a mountain peak. As one grows older, one's resolutions become earthier. They are concerned with such things as giving up tobacco, taking exercise, answering letters, chewing one's food properly, going to bed before midnight, getting up before noon. This may seem a mean list enough, but there is wonderful comfort to be got out of even a modest good resolution, so long as it refers not to the next five minutes, but to tomorrow, or next week, or next month, or next year, or the year after. How vivid, how beautiful tomorrow seems, 
with our lordly regiment of good resolutions ready to descend upon it as upon a city seen afar off for the first time every day lies before us as wonderful as london lay before blucher on the night when he exclaimed my god what a city to loot our life is gorgeous with tomorrows it is all tomorrows good resolutions might be described in the words in which a cabinet minister once described journalism as the intelligent anticipation of events they are however the intelligent anticipation of events which do not take place they are the april of virtue with no september following on the other hand there is much to be said for putting a good resolution into effect now and then there is a brief introductory period in most human conduct before the novelty is worn off when doing things is almost if not quite as pleasant as thinking about them thus if you make a resolve to get up at seven o'clock every day during the year nineteen fifteen you should do it on at least one morning if you do you will feel so surprised with the world and so content with your own part in it that you will decide to get up at seven every morning for the rest of your life but do not be rash getting up early if you do it seldom enough is an intoxicating experience but before long the intoxication fades and only the habit is left it was not the elder brother with his habits but the prodigal with his occasional recurrence into virtue for whom the fatted calf was killed even for the prodigal when once he had settled down to orderly habits the supply of the fatted calves from his father's farm was bound before long to come to an end there are however other good resolutions in which it is not so easy to experiment for a single morning if you resolve to learn german for instance there would be very little intoxication to be got out of a single sitting face to face with a german grammar similarly the inventors of systems of exercise for keeping the townsmen in condition all stress the fact that in order to attain health one must go on toiling morning after morning at their wretched punchings and twistings and kickings till the end of time this is an unfair advantage to take of the ordinary maker of good resolutions he is enticed into the adventure of trying a new thing only to discover that he cannot be said to have tried it until he has tried it on a thousand occasions most of us it may be said at once are not to be enticed into such matters higher than our knees we may go so far as to buy the latest book on health or the latest mechanical apparatus to hang on the wall but soon they become little more than decorations for our rooms that pair of immense dumbbells which we got in our boyhood when we believed that the heavier the dumbbell the more magnificently would our biceps swell who would think of taking them from their dusty corner now then there was that pair of wooden dumbbells light as wind which we tried for a while on hearing that heavy dumbbells were a snare and only hardened the muscles without strengthening them they lie now where the woodlouse may eat them if it has so lowly an appetite but our good resolutions did really array themselves in colors when the first of the exercises was invented there was a thrill in those first mornings when we rose a little earlier than usual and expected to find an inch added to our chest measurement before breakfast that is always the characteristic of good resolutions they are founded on a belief in the possibility of performing miracles if we could swell visibly as a result of a single half hour's tug at weights and wires we would all desert our morning sleep for our exerciser with a will but the faith that believes in miracles is an easy sort of faith the faith that goes on believing in the final excellence though one day shows no obvious advance on another is the more enviable genius it is perhaps the rarest thing in the world and all the good resolutions ever made if placed end to end would not make so much as an inch of it one man i knew who had faith of this kind he used to practice strengthening his will every evening by buying almonds and raisins or some sort of sweet thing and sitting down before them by the hour without touching them and frequently so he told me he would repeat over to himself a passage which poe quotes at the top of one of his stories the fall of the house of usher was it not beginning great are the mysteries of the will 
I envied him his philosophic grimness. I should never have been able to resist the almonds and raisins. But that incantation from Poe, was not that, too, but a desperate clutching after the miraculous? There is nothing which men desire more fervently than this mighty will. It may be the most selfish or unselfish of desires. We may long for it for its own sake or for the sake of some purpose which means more to us than praise. We are eager to escape from that continuous humiliation of the promises we have made to ourselves and broken. It is all very well to talk about being baffled to fight better, but that implies a will on the heroic scale. Most of us, as we see our resolutions fly out into the sun, only to fall with broken wings before they have more than begun their journey, are inclined at times to relapse into despair. On the other hand, nature is prodigal, and in nothing so much as good resolutions. In spite of the experience of half a lifetime of failure, we can still draw upon her for these with the excitement of faith in our hearts. Perhaps there is some instinct for perfection in us, which thus makes us deny our past and stride off into the future, forgetful of our chains. It is the first step that counts, says the proverb. Alas, we know that that is the step that nearly everybody can take. It is when we are about to take the steps that follow that our ankle feels the drag of old habit. For even those of us who are richest in good resolutions are the creatures of a habit just as the baldly virtuous are. The only difference is that we are the slaves of old habits while they are the masters of new ones. On the whole, then, we cannot do better as the new year approaches than resolve to go out once more in quest of the white flower which has already been allowed to fade too long, where Tennyson placed it in the late Prince Consort's buttonhole. End of chapter 2。e of the book of this and that。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit librivox dot org。recording by corey morrell。the book of this and that by robert lynn。chapter t the sin of dancing。it is a pleasure to see a modern clergyman expressing his horror of the dancing of the moment as cain and newbolt did in st paul's one had begun to fear lately that the clergy were trying to run a race of tolerance with the dramatic critics and the nuts on the whole i prefer clergymen in the denouncing mood they are there to remind us that the soul does not pour out its riches in ragtime songs that peter is not to be bribed with trinkets and that the gates of heaven will not so far as is known open to the bark of a toy dog they are there, in a sentence, as the shaven critics of the saltatory world. The history of civilization might be interpreted with some reason as a prolonged conflict between the preachers and the dancers. The preacher and the dancer may both be necessary to us, like east and west in a map, but we feel that, like east and west, they should keep their distance from each other in censorious and reconcilement. I know, of course, that the modern anthropologist is inclined to insist upon the kinship between dancing and religion. We are told that the church was born not, it may be, under a dancing star, but at any rate under a dancing savage. The theory is that man originally expressed his deepest emotions about food, love, and war in dances. In the course of time, the leaping groups felt the need of a leader, and gradually the leader of the dance evolved into a hero, or representative of the group soul and from that he afterwards swelled into a god. This, we are asked to believe, is the lineage of Zeus. The theory strikes me as being too simple to be true. It is like an attempt to spell a long word with a single letter. At the same time, it gains color from the fact that the heads of the church have continually shown a tendency to dancing since the days of King David. We have it on good authority that in the Latin church the bishops were called praesules because they led the dances in the church choir on feast days. It is a fact of some significance, indeed, that at more than one period of history it has been the heretics rather than the orthodox who have raged most furiously against dancing. The Albigenses and the Waldenses are both examples of this. Superficially, this may seem to weaken my contention that preaching and dancing can no more become friends than the lion and the unicorn. 
But if you reflect for a moment, you will see that it is the heretics rather than the orthodox who are, of all men, the most given to preaching. Bishops preach as a matter of duty. Savonarola and Mr. Shaw preach for the religious pleasure of it. So rare a thing it is to find an orthodox clergyman of standing doing anything that deserves the name of preaching. And by preaching, I mean protesting in capable words against the subordination of life to luxury, that, whenever he does so, the newspapers put it on their posters among the great events, like a scandal about a cabinet minister or an earthquake. It is not difficult to see why the preachers have usually been so doubtful about the dancers. It is simply that dancing is, for the most part, a rhythmical pantomime of sex. It is the most haremish of pastimes. One is not surprised to learn that Henry the Eighth was the most expert of royal dancers. He was an enthusiast for the kissing dances of his day. Indeed, even before he had abandoned his youthful straightness for the moral code of a farmyard that had gone off its head, I can imagine how a preacher with his craft at his fingers' ends could deduce Henry's downfall from those first delicate trippings. Even the Encyclopedia Britannica is driven to admit the presence of the amorous element in dancing. Actual contact of the partners, it insists, is quite intelligible as a matter of pure dancing, for, apart altogether from the pleasure of the embrace, the harmony of the double rotation adds very much to the enjoyment. But that reference to the pleasure of the embrace is fatal to the sentence. How are we simple people as we whirl in the waltz to know whether it is the pleasure of the embrace or the harmony of the double rotation that is making us glow so? The preachers will certainly not give us the benefit of the doubt. They will follow the lead of Byron, who, in his horror at the popularization of the waltz, declared that Terpeshor was henceforth the least a vestal virgin of the nine. Many people will remember the letter which Byron prefaced to the waltz over the significance of Horace Hornman, supposed to be a country gentleman from the Midlands. Describing his sensations on first seeing his wife waltzing, Mr. Hornham says, Judge of my surprise to see poor Mrs. Hornman with her arms half round the loins of a huge, hussar-looking gentleman I never set eyes on before, and his, to say truth, rather more than half round her waist, turning round and round and round to a damned seesaw, up and down sort of tune, that reminded me of the black joke. Cynics explain Byron's attitude to dancing as a matter of envy, since he himself was too lame to waltz. At the same time, I fancy that an anthropologist from Mars, if he visited the earth, would take the same view of the drama of the waltz as Byron did. I do not mean to say that the waltz cannot be danced in a sublime innocence. It can, and often is. But the point is that sex is the arch-musician of it, and whether you approve of waltzing or disapprove of it will depend upon whether, like the preachers, you regard sex as ahula and ahaloiba, or, like the poets, as April and the Song of the Stars. It is worth remembering in this connection that a great preacher like Huxley took much the same view of poetry that Byron took of dancing. Most of it, he said, seemed to him to be little more than sensual caterwauling. Tolstoy, if I am not mistaken, interpreted Romeo and Juliet in the same spirit. This kind of analysis, whether it is just foolish, always shocks the crowd, which can never admit the existence of the senses without blushing for them. Confirmed in its sentimentalism, and therefore given to harping on the sensual string, it swears that it finds the Russian ballet more edifying than church, and would have no objection to seeing the merry widow waltz introduced into a mother's meeting. There is nothing in which we are such hypocrites as our pleasures. That is why some of us like the preachers. Even if they are grossly inhuman in wanting to take our amusements away from us, they at least insist that we shall submit them to a realistic analysis. In this, they are excellent servants of the scientific spirit. What, then, is a reasonable attitude to adopt towards sex and dancing? Obviously, we cannot abolish sex, even if we wish to do so. And if we try to chain it up, it will merely become crabbed like a dog. On the other hand, there is all the difference in the world between putting a dog on a chain and encouraging it to go mad and bite half the parish. There is nearly as wide a distance separating the courtly dances of the 18th century from the cakewalk and the Apache dance from the Irish reel. Priests, I know, in whom the gift of preaching has turned sour, have been as severe on innocent as on furious dances. But this is merely an exaggeration of the prevailing sense of mankind that sex is a wild animal and most difficult to tame into a fireside pet. It is upon the civilization of this animal, nonetheless, though not upon the butchering of it, that the decencies of the world depend, and this is exercise for a hero, 
for the animal in question has a desperate tendency to revert to type one noticed how its eye bulged with the memory of african forests when the cakewalk affronted the sun a few years ago the cakewalk i admit seemed a right and rapturous thing enough when it was danced by those in whose veins was the recent blood of africa but when young gentlemen began to introduce it as a figure in the lancers and suburban black parlors one resented it not merely as an emasculated parody but as an act of dishonest innocence but everywhere it has been the tendency of dancing in recent years to become more noisily sexual i am not thinking of the dancing and undress which for a time captured the music halls that is almost the least sexual dancing we have had the dancing of isadora duncan was of good report as a painting by old sir joshua we may pass over the russian ballet too because of the art which often raised it to beauty though it is interesting to speculate what st bernard would have thought of nijinsky but as for ragtime it is a silly madness a business for maenads of both sexes and all those gesticulations of the human frame known as bunny hugs turkey trots and the rest of it are condemned by their very names as tolerable only in menagerie on the other hand because the bunny and man and the turkey and woman have revived themselves with such impudence are we to get out our guns against all dancing far from it one is not going to sacrifice the flowering grace of Janet or pavlova with her genius of the butterflies because of the multitude of fools all we can do is insist upon the recognition of the fact that dancing may be good or bad as eggs are good or bad and to remind the world that in dancing as in eggs freshness is even more beautiful than decadence perhaps some of the performances of the russian ballet would come off limping from such a test opinions will differ about that in any case one cannot help the logic of one's belief each of us no doubt contains something of the preacher and something of the dancer and our enthusiasms depend upon which of the two is dominant in us meanwhile we are likely to go on preaching against our dancing and dancing against our preaching till the end of time that merely proves the completeness of our humanity it makes for balance like as i have said east and west in a map that surely is a conclusion which ought to satisfy everybody End of chapter 3, The Sin of Dancing Chapter 4 of The Book of This and That This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by D. Randall The Book of This and That by Robert Lind Thoughts at a Tango Tea It is not easy to decide what is the dullest feature in the Tango Teas upon which Londoners are now wasting their afternoons and their silver. The most disconcertingly tedious part of the whole entertainment is, in my opinion, the tango itself. It is mere virtuoso work in dancing, an eccentric caper, not after beauty, but after variety but the rest of the program has no compensating liveliness the songs are sad affairs even for a music hall and the band with its continual selections dropped into every available hole in the afternoon's amusement gets on the nerves like a tune played over and over again and then to crown everything comes the parade of mannequins wearing the latest fashions in women's dress or what will be the latest fashions in another month or two on the whole i think this part of the show must be given the prize for inanity the tango is bad and the tea varies but this milliner's business it is more than dull it is an outrage on human intelligence students of society cannot afford to leave unnoticed this new development in the tastes of the upper and middle classes it seems to me to represent almost the extreme limit in the evolution of the english theatre the actor managers have often in recent years turned shakespeare into a dress parade but here is the dress parade with shakespeare left out musical comedies hundreds of them have been as amazing as fireworks with their wonder of costumes and here is the wonder of costumes without any alloy of musical comedy nor are these costumes flashed upon you 
with a chorus insolence. Slowly and separately, each girl appears, sometimes from the back of the stalls, sometimes from the back of the stage, and marches before your vision, as obtrusive as an advertisement, while the band plays some tune like You Made Me Love You. One should not say marches, perhaps, but glides. The glide seems to be the ideal at which the modern woman aims in her walk, and the mannequin glides with every exaggeration. But if you have ever seen cows ambling along a country road, you have seen something strangely like the glide that is now in fashion. Yet no one thinks of speaking of cows as gliding. The mannequins come before us, one by one, at this slow cattle walk, and pass along one of those Reinhardt pathways above the heads of the people in the stalls. Then they raise their arms and turn round, as in the showroom, and smile, as in the advertisement of a toothwash, and so on till ten or a dozen of them have appeared and disappeared. Then out glides the whole school of them again, not singly this time, but in a procession, all smiling under their barbaric panaches and their towering crest of feathers, and one of them with her head and chin wrapped in gilt embroideries that make her look like a queen with a toothache. All smiles and paint, the girls nevertheless seem to have no more relation to their gowns than a statue to the hat which someone has perched on its head. They give us no drama of dress. They are simply lay figures imitating the colors of the rainbow. Perhaps, to a student of fashion, they have some meaning and interest, but a student of fashion does not go for his lessons to a music hall. To the rest of us, they are simply a trash of fine clothes. They are a decadent substitute for gladiatorial exhibitions. They are a last wild, no, no, not wild, a last tame parody on life, life as a parade of mannequins. The satiric imagination could invent nothing more contemptuously comic. Perhaps, in the theater of the future, the characters of the plays will remain as mannequins, while the words will be left out as superfluous. Hamlet will appear in his inky cloak at the right intervals, turn round so as to give us a good back and front view, and Ophelia will then take his place in a procession of fine dresses, the whole play being a solemn in-and-out movement of silent gowned figures. Shakespeare ought to be much more popular that way. Even Shakespeare on the cinematograph could hardly compete with it. What one wonders is the cause of all this mannequinism. Is it a survival of the passion for dolls? Or is it a case of woman's flying to a refuge after man has ousted her from all her old busy pleasures? Scarcely anything but the dress interest is left to her. Woman, at least the kind of woman whom one sees at Tangle Tees, no longer bakes or weaves or spins or makes medicines or even souls as her grandmothers, or to be quite accurate, her grandmothers, grandmothers did. She has gradually been led to hand over her baking to the baker, her medicines to the chemist, her weaving and spinning to the mills. What could Penelope herself do in such circumstances? Without her loom, there would have been nothing for her but to think out fresh ways of arranging her hair and to disguise herself endlessly in new draperies, which would have led to her being pestered more than ever by the suitors. Idleness, it does not take a Sunday school teacher to see, is the universal dressmaker and a woman who is not allowed to work and does not drink and has not even a vote is driven among the mannequins as surely as if you force her there by law. After all, if one has nothing to do, one must do something. 
one must put one's virtue into hats and stockings if one is not allowed to practice it more soberly. It may be, of course, that the mannequin stage, which the women of the comfortable classes have now reached, is really a step towards a more sober dignity. Woman had to be released from the old servitude of the house, from the predestined making of beds and sewing of clothes and cooking of dinners, in order to assert her equal capacities with those of the man who rode to war and cousined his fellows in the city and sat on committees and stayed out to all hours. She may not have realized at the time that it was merely an escape from one drudgery to another, from the drudgery of housework to the drudgery of pleasure, but she cannot take her brains with her into a music hall matinee without realizing it now. And she is learning to hate the one as much as the other. Feminism is woman's great protest against the drudgery of pleasure. Some of the feminists, it may be granted, turn it into a claim to share with man all those old pleasures with which man's eyes have long been yellow and weary. But the spectacle of the middle-aged male followers of the life of pleasure in any restaurant or theater ought to terrify these bold ladies from maintaining such a demand. The supreme philosophers of pleasure, from Epicurus to Stevenson, have all had to turn to hard work and virtue as the only forms of amusement which did not spoil the bloom of one's cheek. Even the supreme philosopher of clothes would have kept us far too busy ever to think about them. People, unfortunately, have got it into their heads as the result of a long process of civilization that, in order to be beautiful, clothes must be a kind of finery to which one gives the thoughts of one's nights and days. And the result is that most women would rather take the advice of their dressmaker than of Epicurus. It is one of the most ludicrous misdirections that the human race has ever followed. The dressmaker's living depends on her keeping off Epicurus with one hand and the Twelve Apostles with the other, and she has certainly done so with the most brilliant efficiency. We who do not live by dressmaking, however, should be coolly critical of the dressmaker's point of view. It was not she, perhaps, who invented but it is she who most brazenly keeps alive the great delusion of civilized society that woman's foolish dresses are more beautiful than the reasonable clothes of men. In 15,000 years or so, when the idea of beauty will have had time to develop into a tiny bud, men and supermen will laugh at this old absurdity. The idea that modern men's clothes are ugly is a deception chiefly maintained by advertisement agents and shopkeepers. There is, I admit, much to be said against the bowler hat. But the jacket, the trousers, and the sock, so long as it does not match the tie, come nearer what is excellent and appropriate in dress than any other costume that has been invented since the strong, silent Englishman left his coat of paint behind him in the wood. It is possible, no doubt, to spoil the effect of it all with too much folding and pressing. Dandyism means the ruin of one's clothes from the aesthetic point of view. One must be ready to expose them to all weathers, to have them rained upon and rumpled if one wants them to be really beautiful, say, like an old church. It is because woman's dress, at its finest, does not stand this test of beauty that a marchioness is worse clad than the driver of a coal cart or a chimney sweep. Not luxury, but necessity, is the creator of beauty. Beauty comes from our submission to nature. It is not a matter of thieving a few handfuls of colored feathers from nature's breasts and wings. It comes by accident. 
as you will see if you look down from a hill at night on a gas-lit town. Almost the only kind of lights which are not beautiful are those which are deliberately so. One has to go out of the streets among the lights of the white city in order to see beauty giving way to prettiness. Similarly, one might say that the only kind of dresses which are not beautiful are those which are deliberately so. Even among the poor, there is more grace to be found among mill girls in their shawls than when on Sundays they dress themselves up to look as like their dream of riches as possible. I hope that the dress parades in the West End theaters and music halls will sooner or later be transferred to the poorer districts. They may not at once kill envy and the respect for wealth. They may not strike people as being so ridiculous as they really are, though anyone who finds amusement in waxworks ought to get sufficient entertainment from a dress parade. But if the show has not this effect, it may at least open the eyes of the poor to the barbarous conditions in which the rich live and fire them with the determination to hurry to the rescue and release them from the gilded cage of their luxuries. The beginning of the social revolution, I foresee, will be a rising against the mannequins. It will be an infinitely greater event in history than the taking of the Bastille. End of chapter 4「Chapter Five of the Book of This and That. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of This and That by Robert Lind. Chapter Five The Humors of Murder. Almost everyone who has committed a murder knows that the business has its tragic side. Whether it also has its comic side is a question that has been raised since the production of Sir James Barry's play, The Adored One. This, as most people are aware, is a farce about a lady who kills a man by pushing him out of a railway carriage, because he will not allow the window to be shut. Some of the critics have protested, that the theme is too grim for light entertainment. They are, most of them, probably lovers of fresh air who foresee a new danger in railway travel if women, creatures already enjoying the possession of an extremely feeble moral sense, are taught to regard the murder of a hygienic fellow-passenger as a laughing matter. Some years ago, when the playboy of the Western world was first put on the stage in Dublin, there were similar denunciations of the idea of making a comedy of murder. It was then considered, however, that nobody outside Ireland could take murder so seriously as to miss seeing the joke of it. As a matter of fact, I believe the average respectable man all the world over would side in his heart with the Dublin demonstrators. Murder is, after all, one of the oldest institutions on earth. It dates from the second generation of the human race. It is almost as venerable as a sin can be, and to treat it flippantly is as shocking to comfortable ears as the blasphemies of a boy. Everybody knows how Baudelaire used to shock the citizens of Brussels by opening his conversations in cafes in a raised voice with the words, The night I killed my father. He has himself related how he began the thing as a joke in order to punish the Belgians for believing everything he said. Exasperated by always being believed, he wrote, I spread the report that I had killed my father, and that I had eaten him, and that, if I had been allowed to escape from France, it was only on account of the services I had rendered to the French police. And I was believed. This is the penalty of the jester on serious subjects like murder. He is nearly always believed. 
the very mention of prepense death puts a great many people into a solemn mood that is hostile to wit and humor and any kind of facetiousness i have met men and women for instance who were quite unable to see the entertaining side of cannibalism gilbert's ballad of the nancy lee about the cook who gradually ate all the rest of the crew moves them not to laughter but to horror when the cook or somebody else as he gobbles one of his mates enthusiastically exclaims oh how like pig they merely shudder those of us who are amused on the other hand are so only because we are not such inveterate realists as our neighbors we treat comic murders as charles lamb treated comic cuckoldries we regard them as happening not in our world of realities but in a kind of no man's land of humor if it were not so we should probably be as shocked as anyone else those of us that is who are old-fashioned enough to consider murder and adultery as on the whole reprehensible luckily human beings in the mass have gradually developed an artistic sense which enables them to leave the world of serious facts for the world of comic pretenses at a moment's notice and even the strictest humanitarian can smile with a good conscience at the most hideous of the tortures something with boiling oil in it discussed in the paper fan world of the mikado i can imagine a sensitive child's being sharply disturbed by the punishments that at one time seemed to be in store for so many of the characters in the opera but for the rest of us gilbert's japan is as unreal as a nest of insects where even the crimes seem funny in the same way we have made a child's joke of bluebeard whose prototype was at least as atrocious a character as jack the ripper perhaps in some distant island of the south seas where europe is sufficiently remote to be unreal the children are already enjoying the humors of jack the ripper in the local substitute for the christmas pantomime even a real murder however may strike one as amusing if only it has about it something incongruous a thousand people have laughed for one who has wept over wainwright's murder of helen abercrombie not because it was not a filthy deed but because the murderer on being reproached for it uttered his famous reply yes it was a dreadful thing to do but she had very thick ankles here it is the incongruity between the deed and the excuse for it that appeals to our sense of humor we laugh at it as we would laugh at milton's satan if we saw him dressed in baby clothes similarly when peer gint and the cook fight after the shipwreck for possession of the place of safety on the upturned boat and peer in effect murders the cook the situation is comic because of the incongruity between what is said and what is done take for instance the lord's prayer scene the cook slipping i'm drowning peer seizing him by this wisp of hair i'll hold you say your lord's prayer quick the cook i can't remember all turns black peer come the essentials in a word the cook gave us this day peer skip that part cook you'll get all you need safe enough the cook give us this day peer the same old song tis plain you were a cook in life the cook slips from his grasp the cook sinking give us this day ah uh, disappears peer amen lad to the last gasp you were yourself draws himself up on to the bottom of the boat so long as there is life there's hope it is the paradox that delights us here the exquisite inappropriateness of peer's invitation to the cook to say a prayer before he lets him dip under for the last time 
and of the only petition which the cook can remember in his extremity. The latter amuses us like Mr. George Moore's story about the Irish poet, who was asked to say a prayer when out in a curra on Galway Bay during a furious gale, and who astonished the boat's crew by beginning, Of man's first disobedience and the fruit. Even in the playboy, it is the humors of the inappropriate that make Christy Mahan's narrative of how he slew his da comic. One remembers the sentence in which he first lets the secret of his deed slip out. Christie, Don't strike me. I killed me poor father. Tuesday was a week for doing the like o' that. Pegine, in blank amazement. Has I killed your father? Christie, subsiding. With the help of God I did, surely, and that the holy immaculate mother may intercede for his soul. There you have incongruity to a point that shocks an ordinary Christian like a blasphemy, and Christie's reflection as he finds that the supposed murder has made him a hero. I'm thinking this night wasn't I a foolish fellow not to kill my father in the years gone by, tickles us because it brings a new and incongruous standard to the measurement of moral values. De Quincey's essay on murder considered as one of the fine arts, owes its reputation for humor to the same kind of unexpectedness in its table of values. At least, that passage in which the lecturer of the essay describes the warning he gave to a new servant whom he suspected of dabbling in murder plays a delightful topsy-turvy game with our everyday moral world. If once a man indulges himself in murder, very soon he comes to think very little of robbing, and from robbing he comes next to drinking and Sabbath-breaking, and from that to incivility and procrastination. Once begin upon this downward path, you never know where you are to stop. Many a man has dated his ruin from some murder or other, that perhaps he thought little of at the time. Humor is largely a matter of new proportions and unexpected elements, and it visits the jail as readily as the music hall, and attends us in our hearse no less than in our perambulator. Self-murder is not in itself a funny subject, but who can remain solemn over the case of the man who put an end to his life because he got tired of all the buttoning and unbuttoning? Similarly, detestable a crime as we may think cannibalism, we cannot help smiling when a traveler notes, as a recent traveler in West Africa did, that human flesh never gives the eater indigestion as the flesh of beasts does. It is, at least I suppose it is, merely a statement of fact, but it amuses us because it introduces an inappropriate and unexpected element into our consideration of cannibalism. Perhaps Sir James Barry would prefer to defend the humor of the adored one on the ground not that it is the humor of unreality, but that, like the examples I have quoted, it is the humor of incongruity. And indeed, we only laugh at Leonora's murder in the train because the reason for it was so disproportionate to the crime. It is not funny for a woman to kill a man because he has beaten her black and blue. It is not funny for her to kill him for his money or for any other reasonable motive. On the other hand, it would be funny if she killed him for smoking a pipe while wearing a tall hat or because he said lay instead of lie. It is the unreason of the thing that appeals to us, and no amount of theorizing about the immorality of murder can deprive us of our joke. At the same time, one is willing to admit the excellence of those people who are so overwhelmed by the exceeding sinfulness of sin that they cannot raise a smile over even the most ridiculous scenes of murder and marital infidelity. 
I know a great many people who can see nothing comic in the upside-down antics of the drunken. They feel as if in laughing at the absurdities of vice they would be acquiescing in vice. Perhaps they would. Perhaps laughter is given to sinners as a compensation for sins. It makes us tolerant by making us cheerful. And if we could really laugh at murders and all indecencies, we should possibly end in thinking that they are far less black than they are painted. So, I imagine, the unlaughing saints reason. They always visualize sin in its horror in a way that is beyond most of us, and we can respect their gloom. But we who are more complex than the saints, we know well enough that so paradoxical an affair is the human soul that a man may laugh and laugh and keep the Ten Commandments, and we claim the right on the plea that my mind to me a kingdom is of maintaining a court fool in our hearts to parody our royal existence, and so keep it from going stale. In any case, we can no more help laughing than we can help the color of our hair. That is why we shall go on laughing at the humors of the seven deadly sins, and why old scoundrels like Nero and Gilles de Ray and Henry the Eighth are likely to remain favorite characters in the comic chapters of human life till the book is burnt and a new volume opens. End of chapter 5 Recorded by Tom Daly Chapter 6 of the Book of This and That This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Corey Morrill the Book of This and That by Robert Lind, Chapter 6 The Decline and Fall of Hell It is significant of the change that has come over the religious imagination that a number of representative clergymen have issued a manifesto of disbelief in hell and no heresy hunt has begun. Disbelief in hell, it must in fairness be added, not as a symbol of something sufficiently real, but as a definite place on the map of the universe, a gulf of wild flame and red-hot torments without end. There was a time when to doubt any jot or tittle in the scenery and rhetoric of hell would have been thought a kind of atheism, and a world without hell would have seemed to many religious minds almost as lonely as a world without God. Life was conceived chiefly in terms of hell. It was a kind of tightrope walk across a bottomless pit of shooting fires and the intolerable wailing of the damned. Heaven was sought less almost for its proper delights than as an escape from the malignance of the demons in this vast torture chamber. Hell, indeed, was the most desperately real of countries. For centuries man studied its geography with greater zeal of research than we devote today to the geography of Africa. They described its rule and estimated its population, one author with how much belief I know not, detailing the names of 72 of its princes with 7,405,926 devils serving them. In the Apocalypse of St. Peter, which is as old at least as the second century, the occupations of the damned are set forth with a horrid carefulness. Hell is depicted as a continent of lakes of fire and burning mud, over which adulterers hang by the hair and blasphemers of the way of righteousness by the tongue. False witnesses chew tongues of fire in their mouths. Misers roll on red-hot stones sharper than spikes. Men who have committed unnatural crimes are endlessly hurled from the top of dreadful crags, and this is but one of the first of a long line of visions of the hereafter which appeared, like the season's fruits, all through the early Christian centuries in the Middle Ages, and achieved their perfect statement in Dante. Every new writer sought out the most exquisite torment a sensational imagination could invent, and added them to the picture of the daily life of hell and purgatory. The monk of Evansham saw in his dreams of purgatory men being fried in a pan and others pierced with fiery nails even to their bones and to the loosening of their joints. Others were gnawed by worms or dragged with hooks or hung on gallows or soaked in baths of pitch and brimstone with a horrible stench. And if they tried to escape, the devils that met with them beat them sorely with scourges and forks and other kinds of torments. But we need not go back beyond our own days for instances of these torturing imaginations. Many who are now living have had the night fears of their childhood made monstrous with stories of devils with red-hot pincers to tear one's flesh and with red-hot nails to lacerate one's back. 
I have a friend who loves to tell of the regular Sunday summons of an ancient clergyman to his congregation to flee from the doom of the condemned sinner, whom he invariably pictured as seated upon a projecting crag over a lurid, hissing, moaning, raging sea of an undone eternity, calling out, The harvest is past and I am not saved. Why the human imagination did not revolt against such a painful orgy of sensationalism long before it did, it is difficult to understand. Lecky tells us that the only prominent theologian to dispute the material fire of hell throughout the Middle Ages was the Irishman Johannes Scotus Erigena. All the others accepted it in either terror or with delight. For who can question that men can obtain as fiercely sensual a pleasure from inflicting the pains of hell on their enemies as from flogging children and slaves? One of the best-known instances of this, shall I say, hellish sensualism is the appeal of Tertullian to his fellow Christians not to attend public spectacles on the ground that they would one day behold the far more glorious spectacle of the heathen rolling in the flames of the pit what he wrote shall be the magnitude of that scene how shall i wonder how shall i laugh how shall i rejoice how shall i triumph when i behold so many and such illustrious kings who are said to be mounted into heaven groaning with jupiter their god in the lowest darkness of hell then shall the soldiers who persecuted the name of christ burn in more cruel fire than any they had kindled for the saints compared with such spectacles with such subjects of triumph as these what can praetor or consul quaestor or pontiff afford and even now faith can bring them near imagination can depict them as present thus hell became the poor man's consolation the oppressed and baited man's revenge sleep itself hardly brought greater balm than the thought of this large engulfing doom for opprobrious neighbors it would be unfair on the other hand to suggest that the ordinary christian ever believed in hell save in honesty of misery of heart o oh lord an old lay evangelist used to pray in the homes he visited shake these thy children over hell-fire but shake them in mercy there you have the voice of one who regarded hell not with glee as the end of his enemies but with desperate earnestness as a necessary moral agency who believe that men must be terrorized into virtue or never know virtue at all and it is interesting to note a clerical correspondent has been writing to the daily news expressing the same gloomy view this writer declares as the fruit of long experience that he has never known a case of man's being converted except through fear it is common enough too or used to be to hear church-going young men profess that if they did not believe in hell they would amaze the earth with their lusts and exploits Viewed in this light, the devil becomes the world's super-policeman, and those who seek to abolish him will naturally be looked on as dangerous anarchists who would destroy the foundations of law. As for that, it would be foolish to deny the great part played by fear in the lives both of sinners and saints. But whether morality is ultimately served by our being afraid of the wrong things is a question that calls for consideration. Certainly, hell has produced its crop of devils as well as of saints upon earth. It was men who believed in hell who invented the thumbscrew and the rack and many of the most fiendish instruments of torture the world has known. Whether it is the case that man made hell because he believed in torture, or took to torture because he believed in hell, there is no denying that the worst period of torture our European civilization has known coincided with the time when men believed that God himself doomed to savage and eternal torments, men, women, and even infants in the cradle, on the most paltry excuses and as men's conscience has more and more decisively forbidden him to use torture as a punishment it has also forbidden him to believe that a beneficent deity could do such a thing it may be thought that a beneficent deity would permit cancer and the putumayo and the factory system at its worst might easily enough sanction the fires of the medieval hell but even cancer and the putumayo are not a denial of what stevenson called the ultimate decency of things they are temporary not eternal thoughtful christians can no longer accept the old hell because it would mean not the final triumph of righteousness but the final defeat of god many of those who dutifully cling to the dogma of their church on the point would agree with the french cure who said that he believed in hell but he did not think there was anybody in it except voltaire and even voltaire will nowadays seem to most people to be hardly a sufficiently scandalous person to deserve infinite millions of years of anguish the truth is hell shocks our moral sense Tennyson put the modern disbelief in it with the theoretical forcibleness when he said that if after death he woke up, even though it should be in heaven and found there was a hell, he would turn round and shake his fist in the face of God Almighty. Since Tennyson's time, hell's foundations have subsided, the ancient flames have died down, and man has now for the background of his days no fierce and devouring universe, but a cricket scoreboard and a page of thinklet competitions in a penny paper. Perhaps the antithesis is an unfair one. 
but some cosmic sense has certainly been lost to the general imagination no doubt it will return as moral ideas take the place of materialistic terrors for out of the wreck of the fiery hell a moral hell is already rising a moral purgatory one ought to say a place of discipline made in the image of this disciplining earth for the terrors of death and evil and pain all survive and if we abolish utterly the devil with the pitchfork and put in his place the button moulder is that a figure a pennyworth less dreadful no the escape from hell is not so much a holiday as we thought there is still an interval of adventure between us and paradise and all the perils and fears to be overcome as of old we have chased an allegory from our doors but its ghostly reality returns and stands outside the window and salvation and damnation remain the two chief facts under the sun and the saints and the parsons and everybody indeed except gloating old tertullian were right after all end of chapter six chapter seven of the book of this and that this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of This and That by Robert Lind On Cheerful Readers There has been an increasing demand lately for cheerful books. Mr. Balfour began it, at least, he gave it a voice by quoting approvingly a phrase from one of Mr. Bennett's novels about the books that cheer us all up. It was a most unfortunate phrase to quote in public. It confirmed every bald old Scaramouche in all his hostilities to realism, tragedy, and every other form of literature that does not go about with its hat over its eye. It also confirmed a popular prejudice to the effect that it is the duty of men of letters to be cheerful in a way in which it is not the duty, say, of mathematicians to be cheerful. Now, one need not be an enemy of cheerfulness to detest this theory. One merely needs to be sufficiently awake to recognize that cheerfulness may easily become a tyranny which will bind the hands and feet of literature as it has already bound the hands and feet of drama. Cheerfulness, cheerfulness, and yet again cheerfulness is the all-too-golden rule in the theater. One result of this is that Ibsen has been expelled from the stage for the only naughtiness of which the English theater takes notice, the naughtiness of being serious. Even Mr. Shaw, who possesses the comic spirit in greater abundance than any other writer of his time, is flayed alive by the critics on the production of each new play he writes, because, besides being cheerful, he is a man of ideas. It is not enough that you should be cheerful. You must be cheerful to the exclusion of everything else, everything at least that might bring unrest to the intellect or the spirit, or to any other part of a man except the muscles that work the oil wells of sentiment and the creaking jaws of laughter. The consequences might have been foreseen. No one, unaided, could be quite so inhumanly vacuous as the audiences in the theaters expected him to be. And so the dramatic author had to call in to his aid the musicians, the poets, the limelight men, the mask sellers, the dancing girls, the dressmakers, and a host of other people, each of whom separately could only be a little inane, but all of whom together could be overwhelmingly inane, and among them they produced that overwhelming inanity, musical comedy. There you have the ultimate logic of cheerfulness in the theater. It is like the obtrusive cheerfulness of the performing animals in music halls. It is a tedious and beastly thing. It is cheerfulness without mind or meaning. It is like a laugh painted on a clown's face. Compulsory cheerfulness must always end like that, because, if one has to laugh all the time, it is far easier to put the laugh on with a brush than to keep one's face distorted by strength of will. With the warning of the cheerful theatre before us, then, it would be the stupidest folly to pay any heed to the new plea for cheerful books. It is an extraordinary fact that thousands of people can be serious to the point of bad temper over a political argument or a game of cards or tennis, but if you asked them to take a book seriously, they would regard the prospect as worse than a dry pharyngitis. They put literature on a level not with their games, but with the chocolates and drinks they consume when they are resting from their games. It is of the chocolate kind of literature that 99 out of 100 persons are thinking when they applaud phrases about the books that cheer us all up. Or it might be nearer the mark to liken the sort of literature they have in mind to one of those brands of medicated port 
which innocent old ladies find grateful and comforting. We live in an age of advertised brain fag, and we demand of literature that it shall be the literature of brain fag. We ask of it not friendship, but a drug. That is the heresy which must be killed if letters are to live. Till it is killed, they will not even be enjoyed. I grant at once that it would be an impudence to expect an average sensual man to regard books with the same profound interest as his business affairs or his wife. On the other hand, persuade him that it is pleasant to put as much of his heart into the enjoyment of a book as he puts into the enjoyment of a football match, and you will produce a revolution among the book-reading public. No man who is not eccentric dreams of asking that a football match shall be amusing or a game of chess cheerful. He goes to the one for its furious energy, for the thrill of the rivalry of real people. He turns to the other for an experience of intensity, of prescient skill. It is for energetic experiences of a comparable kind, as Mr. R. A. Scott James suggestively pointed out in a recent volume, that we go to literature. Literature is not primarily meant to cheer us up when we are too tired to read the paper, although incidentally it often does so, and to despise this kind of literature would be as sinful as to despise Christmas pudding and brandy sauce. But the purpose of literature is not to be an epilogue to energy. It involves not a slackening, but a change of effort. That is why even the difficult authors, like the Browning of Sordeo, attract us. They have the appeal of pathless mountains. It is a curious fact, at the same time, that some of those who delight most boldly in physical experiences turn from intellectual and imaginative experiences with a kind of contempt. They despise from their hearts the mollycoddle who will not risk a wound or a cold for the pleasures of the sun and air. But, so far as the imagination is concerned, they themselves are mollycoddles who will not venture beyond a game of halma or a sugar stick by the hearth. What the world of literature needs most is not cheerful writers, but adventurous readers. The reading of poetry will become as popular as swimming once it is recognized that it is as natural and as exhilarating. Literature thus justifies itself not so much by cheering us all up when we are limp as by its appeal to the spirit of adventure, or, if you like the phrase better, the spirit of experience. That is the explanation of the pleasure we take in tragic literature. Tragedy reminds certain spiritual energies in us that they are alive. It enables them to expand, to exert themselves, to breathe freely. That is why, in literature, it makes us happy to be miserable. To put forth our strength, whether of limb or of imagination, makes for our happiness far more than the passive cheerfulness of the fireside or if not more, at least as much. It would be ungrateful to speak slightingly of the easy chair and its pleasures. But the chief danger in literature, at present, is not that the easy chair will be neglected, but that it will be given a place of far too great importance. Hence, it is necessary to emphasize the pleasures of the strenuous life in contrast. This may seem to some readers a tolerable excuse for liking tragedy and poetry, but a poor defense of the taste for realism, naturalism, or whatever you like to call it. Even those who respond immediately to the appeal of the mountains and the sea will often resist the invitation of Zola and Huismans and their followers to seek adventures in the slums. They will not see that it is as natural to go on one's travels in the slums as in the most beautiful lakeland on earth. As a matter of fact, the discovery of the slums was one of the most tremendous discoveries of the 19th century. It was one of those revolutionary discoveries that have changed our whole view of society. Whether it was the men of letters or the sociologists who first discovered them, I do not know. I contend, however, that the men of letters had as much right to go to them as the sociologists. They found life expressed there in horror and beauty, in sordidness and nobility, and to reveal this in literature was, to some extent, to create a new world for the imagination. It was to do more than this. Society could not become fully self-conscious or articulate until the pauper aspect of it was expressed in literature. Hence, the novelist of mean streets extended the boundaries of social self-consciousness. The realists indeed have brought the remedial imagination to us as the sociologist has brought the remedial facts and figures. This remedialism, no doubt, is an extra-literary interest but nothing is quite alien to literature which touches the imagination.
The imagination may find its treasures in Tyre and Sidon, or in an alley off a back street, or even in a semi-detached villa. One must not limit it in its wanderings to safe and clean and comfortable places. This seems to me to be the great justification of the demand, not for cheerful books, but for cheerful and courageous readers. The cheerful reader will be able to go to hell with Dante and to hospital with Esther Waters, and though this may be but a poor and second-hand courage, it is at least preferable to the intellectual and imaginative cowardice which will admit danger into literature only when it has been stripped of every semblance of reality. The courage of the study, it may be, is not so fine a thing as the courage of the workshop and the field, but it is finer than is generally admitted, and it is much rarer. There is no place in which men and women are so shamelessly lazy and timid as among their books. If happiness lay in that direction, the laziness might be justified, but it does not. Happiness can never come from the atrophy of nine-tenths of our nature. It is the result of the vigorous delight of heart and mind and spirit as well as of body. The cheerful reader feels as ready for Aeschylus and his furies as the yachtsman for his sail on a choppy sea. He fears the tragic satire of Madame Bovary no more than a good pedestrian fears the east wind. This is not to say that he does not enjoy cheerful books when he finds them. He may even prefer Tristram Shandy in the Pickwick Papers to Tolstoy, but he realizes that cheerfulness in a book is a delightful accident, not a necessity of literature. He knows that to be cheerful is his own business, whether he goes with his author into the dark and solitary places or into the sheltered and smiling gardens of the sun. End of chapter 7《Chapter Eight of the Book of This and That》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《The Book of This and That》by Robert Lynn — Chapter Eight — St. GBS and the Bishop There has been a delightful correspondence going on in the Times about Mademoiselle Gabby Deslys. It owed not a little of its charm, I suspect, to the fact that none of the correspondents had seen Gabby. The Bishop of Kensington had not seen her, Mr. H. B. Irving had not seen her, Mr. Bernard Shaw had not seen her. So they quarrelled furiously over her, as men have always quarrelled over the unseen, and if Aesop had been alive he might have got a fable out of the affair. The Bishop made the mistake at the beginning of calling upon the censor to suppress Gabby. Mr. Shaw, at mention of the censor, immediately saw red, and Gabby of the Lilies presented herself to his inflamed vision as a beautiful damsel who was about to be made a meal of by an ecclesiastical monster. He at once challenged the bishop to battle, a battle of theories. The bishop, unfortunately, had no theory with him. He took his stand upon the law. After the manner of Shylock, he insisted upon his pound of flesh. Mr. Shaw, of course, who bristled with theories, could not stand this. So he gave the bishop his choice of theories, and even put several into his mouth and forced a conflict upon him. And it was a famous victory. But what they fought each other for, I could not well make out. Perhaps Mr. Shaw himself did not quite know. But he made during the fight some weird statements which are well worth examination. One of these was that in regard to sex, as in regard to religion, it is very difficult to say what is good and what is evil, and more difficult still to suppress the one without suppressing the other. So much is this so, according to Mr. Shaw, that one man seeing a beautiful actress will feel that she has made all common debaucheries impossible to him. Another seeing the same actress in the same part will plunge straight into those debaucheries because he has seen her body without seeing her soul. But why choose a beautiful actress for the argument? The matter can only be debated fairly if we take the case of an actress whose lure is not beauty, but some indecency of attitude, gesture, or phrase which is meant to awaken the debauchee, keeping house in the breast of each of us with the ineffectual angel, and which either does this or bores us into the bar. I do not, I may say, refer to Gabby Deslys, whom I too have not seen. I made more than one attempt, but the crush of beauty-lovers was too great. 
It is quite easy to imagine an actress such as I have described. Most of us have, in the course of many hours misspent in music halls, seen her. To say that she may do good as well as harm is the same as saying that an indecent photograph may do good as well as harm. If this is to be the last word on the subject, then there is no logical reason why we should not decorate the walls of elementary schools with indecent photographs instead of maps, and teach the children limericks instead of Lady Clara Vere de Vere and the Wreck of the Hesperus. Mr. Shaw may retort that he would allow any man who did not find indecent photographs and limericks objectionable to have his fill of them, but that he would not allow him to thrust them upon children but this is to pass a moral judgment. If it is not certain whether the dangers of the sensual parodies of the arts are greater than the dangers of religion, or, say, of geography, there is surely no more reason for preserving the children from one than from the other. Even if we waive this point for the sake of argument, is Mr. Shaw's other position tenable? That if we consider any form of entertainment objectionable, we should show our disapproval not by trying to have it stopped, but simply by staying away from it. Surely even in the music-hall performances there is a line to be drawn somewhere. We can no more be sure where good ends and evil begins than we can be sure where light ends and darkness begins. But we all have a good enough notion of when it is dark, and it is not so very difficult to tell when a music-hall turn is out of bounds. Some people, it may be granted, run to excess in their sense of propriety, they are as delicate as the lady who, when carving a chicken at table, used to inquire, Will you have a wing or a limb? On the other hand, there is an equally large number of people who have no delicacy at all, but who are always ready to greet the obscene with a cheer. Their favorite meal of entertainment is brutality for an entree, and sensuality for a sweet. They can even mix their dishes at times, as, many years ago in Paris, when a woman stripped to the waist, and with her hands tied behind her back, used to get down on her knees and wait for rats to be loosed out of a cage, and kill them one by one with her mouth. Is there no reason for suppressing a show of this kind except that it is rough on rats? I think there is. It deserves suppression because it is what we call, in a vague word, degrading. It is easy enough for a lively imagination to picture as beastly a scene in which there would be no rats present, and which, even if a thousand youths and maidens were willing to pay night after night to see it, would still be a case for the police. One cannot help feeling that in attacking the bishop in regard to the liberty of music halls, Mr. Shaw has allowed himself to be made angry by the way in which the church nearly always concentrates on sex when it wishes to make war on sin. Probably he does well to be angry. It is always worth while to denounce the church for making morality so much an affair of abstinences. On the other hand, the church and the prophets have realized by a wise instinct that this planet on which we live tends perpetually to become a huge disorderly house, and that the history of the world is largely the history of a struggle for decency. At times, no doubt, the world has also been in danger of being converted into a tyrannous Sabbath school, but that was usually an aftermath of disorder. There is no denying that the average human being finds it far easier to learn to leer than to learn to sing psalms. The fight against the leer is one of the first necessities of civilization. It may be argued that a policeman cannot be sent in pursuit of a leer as he can in search of a pickpocket, and that if he were, he would more probably than not run it to earth in some masterpiece of art or literature. But what about the leer when it has been isolated? when it has no more connection with art or literature than with Esperanto. Mr. Shaw seems to think that even in that case the attempt to suppress it would be a form of persecution. But is it persecution to take action against pickpockets, or against employers who dodge the factory acts, or against the corruptors of children? Surely there are offenses that are capable of being dealt with by magistrates. Only the most innocent optimist can believe that sweating, for instance, can be put an end to by public opinion in the abstract as effectively as it can be stopped by public opinion acting through the police. It is no argument to say that if we suppress certain music hall turns because we dislike them, those who object to the theory of the atonement have an equal right to try to suppress the teaching and preaching of that doctrine. Might not the same argument be used against interference with thieves and forgers, or still more extreme criminals in the pursuit of their livelihood? After all, 
supposing the methodists added to the calvinist and wesleyan varieties already in existence a new sect of say aphrodisiac methodists it is quite easy to conceive not only public opinion but the police interfering with it with the approval of the mass of moral and immoral citizens similarly if a sect of particular baptist thugs made its appearance its religious complexion would hardly save it from suppression there might still be half a dozen apostles of religious freedom who would tell you that you could not logically take action against the thugs and the aphrodisiacs without preparing the way for the prohibition of bible reading and for burning psalm singers at the stake but common sense knows better it knows that there are certain things which must be put down either by public opinion or by the police if the world is to remain a place into which it is worth a child's while to be born it knows too that the liberty to seek after truth and beauty in one's own way does not necessarily involve the liberty to say or to do whatever beastly thing one pleases even if thousands of people enjoy it if it did then the censor's interference with mrs warren's profession would be an act of the same kind as scotland yard's interference with the worst kind of night clubs at the same time one need not deny that the difficulty of deciding what should be suppressed and what should not is immense i see that in some part of the world or other isidore duncan's dancing has been prohibited i myself have met a lady who when she was taken to see madame duncan was in an agony of blushes till she got out into the street but she sat through the merry widow without turning a hair what then is to be the test in these matters on the whole i think it is a good rule to fight against the suppression of anything that can by any stretch of the imagination be considered honestly intended or beautiful in the arts one can believe without casuistry beauty ultimately transforms the beast but there are forms of art literature and drama which are nothing else than a kind of indecent exposure let us give them the benefit of the doubt so long as there is a doubt but when there is no doubt let them be given the benefit of the policeman i wonder whether mr shaw would have argued so fiercely on the other side if the bishop had not dragged in the censor if the controversy had not got mixed up with the censorship indeed it would have greatly simplified matters mr shaw seems to have begun to belabor the bishop from a feeling that a blow to the bishop was a blow to the censor but having once begun he seems to have gone on simply because he enjoyed beating a bishop and of the remains there were gathered up twelve baskets full but all the same i cannot help feeling that the bishop perished in a good cause end of chapter eight recording by philip gould Chapter 9 of the Book of This and That. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of This and That by Robert Lind. Chapter 9 Stupidity. Surely honest men may thank God they belonged to the stupid party. The Spectator, March 28th. 1914. It is a terrible thing to boast of stupidity, even in irony. It is a still more terrible thing to associate stupidity with honesty. There is a good deal to be said in favor of honesty, but stupidity in the garb of honesty is the merest masquerader. There was once a member of a local body whom I heard praised in the words He's the only honest man in the corporation, and that is because he is too stupid to be anything else. I doubt if predestined honesty of this sort is entitled to a statue. It has its public uses, no doubt, as an occasional stumbling block to those who traffic both in their own and other people's virtue. Here, at least, is virtue that cannot be bought at a crisis. On the other hand, it does not withstand the temptations of gold a bit more sturdily than it withstands the appeals of reason. It will not move either for a thousand pounds or for the archangel Gabriel. It bars the way to heaven and the road to hell impartially. It has the unbudgeableness of the ass rather than the adaptability which enables human beings to survive on this wrinkled planet. 
even so one may admit a sneaking respect and affection for honest stupid people in private life it is when they feel called upon to devote their combined honesty and stupidity to public affairs that one begins to tremble and to wonder whether after all an honest fool or a clever rogue is likely to do better service to the state oscar wilde once said it was well that good people did not live to see the evil results of their goodness and that wicked people did not live to see the good results of their wickedness this is true perhaps no matter how cunning one may be in one's virtue or how provident in one's vices but it is especially true of that blind and bigoted honesty which cannot see further than its nose i know a town where the lamplighter twenty years ago was an honest old man of the blind and bigoted type it was his duty to go out and light the lamps of the little town on every night when there was no moon one month however it was noticed that all the lamps were alight while the moon was blazing and that when the moon was dark the lamps were dark too the old man was called before the town committee to account for his disobedience to orders instead of apologizing however he firmly insisted that he had done his duty and produced a calendar to prove that there was no moon on the night on which everybody had seen it shining and that it might have reasonably been expected to shine on the nights on which it was obscured he was asked why he did not trust his eyes but he said that he always went by the calendar and he would not yield an inch of his position till someone took the calendar from him and noticed that it was not even a current one but a calendar of the previous year there i think is a dramatization of a very common form of honesty it is as common among cabinet ministers and churchmen as among aged lamplighters it expresses itself in adherence not only to antiquated mother seagull calendars but to constitutions and confessions of faith that have lost their meaning whether this can justly be called honesty at all is a question with something to be said on both sides it is certainly stupidity of the very best quality one of the reasons why one rather disbelieves in reverencing stupidity is that it is not always as honest as it looks it is often an armor instinctively if not deliberately put on by comfortable people this kind of stupidity has sometimes been attributed to excessive eating and drinking as when hollinshed wrote of the sixteenth century scots that they far exceed us in overmuch and distemperate gourmandise and so engross their bodies that diverse of them do oft become unapt to any other purpose than to spend their times in large tabling and belly cheer but i have known gluttons who have yet had all their wits about them and the ladies who could hardly get through the wing of a chicken and were nevertheless as stupid as a prize cat blinking beside the fire there is more in it than the stomach stupidity of the kind i mean is really an ingeniously built castle with moat and drawbridge to guard against the entrance of the facts of life at least of the disagreeable facts of life it is by a perfect network of castles of this kind that so many feudal privileges have been kept alive generations after any one defends the idea of feudalism against stupidity it has been said the gods themselves fight in vain and it is hardly to be wondered at that democracy also falls back from the impassive walls of those old castles like a broken tide it is only fair to say however that again and again different noble inmates how suggestive a word of the castles have refused to shelter themselves behind the drawbridge of stupidity and have even offered to lead the people in an assault on castles in general 
it is then usually discovered that the people too have their dear retreat of stupidity to which they fly on the first hint of a raid upon utopia the stupidity of the underfed is an even more desperate thing than the stupidity of the overfed and when a castellan offers his sword to the cause they merely look at each other and ask darkly what's he going to get out of it it is the popular stupidity which led mr shaw the other day to observe that he had more hope of converting a millionaire than a millionaire's chauffeur to socialism certainly it is the stupid in the back streets who make the stupid in the castles secure the latter see in the former indeed not only their first line of defence but their justification they see their justification however in everything and everybody they wrap themselves up in little comforting thoughts that the poor do not feel things as the respectable do i have heard a comfortable artist for instance in winter arguing that there was no need to pity a blind beggar shivering at a street corner each of us is kept warm he declared by a little stove in his stomach and you would be surprised to know how little it takes to keep a man like that's stove alight you see he's been training himself all his life to do with very little food and very little clothing and to sit out in all kinds of weather a fall in the temperature that would paralyze you or me would affect him hardly more than a fall in the price of champagne you see he's learned to do without things there was almost a note of envy in his voice for the man who had learned to do without things without soap and meat and blankets and clothes brushes and servants and fires and sunshine that seems to be one of the favorite hypocrisies of the stupid the pretense of envying the poor i have seen a merchant grow suddenly eloquent as he described the happy lot of the working man who had nothing to do but draw his wages and compared it with the anxious life of the employer who had all the cares and responsibilities of the business on his shoulders the rich never feel so good as when they are speaking of their possessions as responsibilities here a mistress set forth the advantages of the life of a servant girl how she not only gets higher wages than servants ever got before but think of the food and the rent to pay she even becomes mawkish over the fortune of a girl who was too poor to be called upon to pay rates and taxes alas these ideals of the kitchen are all written in the drawing-room if a servant's life were all a matter of freedom from rent and rates and taxes and the worries of making both ends meet on a thousand a year the idols would be apt enough but it is just possible that even to make both ends meet on twenty-five pounds a year may have its own difficulties certainly one has a right to suspect these ladies who glorify the life of a cook and the parlour-maid i will refuse to believe in them till i hear that one of them has run away from her husband to take one of those sinecures advertised in the domestic service columns of the morning post but perhaps their sense of duty is too strong to allow them to fly from their responsibilities in that way stupidity might be defined as resignation to other people's misfortunes alternatively is it a way of regarding comforts as responsibilities and of getting out of one's uncomfortable responsibilities altogether there is no greater enemy of change for granted enough stupidity it is easy to believe that hell itself is heaven it is the stupidity of the rich rather than deliberate heartlessness that permits so many of them to live cheerfully on ill-paid labor and slum rents fortunately the cheerful dullness of rich people is rarer than it was a century ago then it was reinforced by political economy which regarded transactions in human beings in much the same light as transactions in pounds of tea our first awakening to the right of other people to live 
happened just before we gave up cannibalism. The second happened just before we gave up slavery. The third will happen just before we give up capitalism. Obviously, it is only our stupidity which enables us to go on putting the rights of Tom, Dick, and Harry before the rights of the race. It is only our stupidity which makes us believe that, while it is right that superfluous wealth should be taxed a shilling in the pound for the good of all, it would be robbery to tax it ten shillings in the pound for the good of all. The first statesman who levied the first tax thereby announced the dual ownership of property between the citizen and the state. He vindicated the right of the state, representing the common good, as against the individual representing only his private good to a first share in property. The income tax stands for exactly the same principle in regard to state rights as would the nationalization of the land or the railways. As we grow less stupid, we shall gradually awake to the fact that there is no right to food and shelter and state benevolence that we possess which our neighbors ought not also in justice to possess. We shall gradually understand, for instance, that it is not worth while that a thousand children should be brought up in the gutters of misery in order that a few dozen young gentlemen may sup on plover's eggs. It has already dawned upon us that if pensions are good for field marshals, they cannot be so very bad for linen lappers. Perhaps we shall yet come to see that a pension is a very good thing to begin life with as well as to end life with. In the meantime, most of us are either too comfortable or too miserable to think about such things. Our stupidity, at least, keeps conscience or revolution from destroying the peace of our meals. End of section 9《Chapter Ten of the Book of This and That》this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of This and That by Robert Lynn. Chapter 10. Waste. When Mr. Churchill referred in Manchester to the piling up of armaments as so much misdirected human energy, he said something which men of all parties will agree except those few romantic souls who believe that it is a bracing thing to shed the blood of a foreigner every now and then obviously if two men live beside one another and if each of them is so afraid of the others climbing secretly into his back garden that he hires a watchman to walk up and down the garden path all day and night with a six-shooter in his hand he is wasting on his fears a great deal of energy that might be expended on cabbages. Again, if there is a stream running between the gardens, and if each of the householders is always preparing for the day when the other may question his right to use the water, he will have to hire other strong men. And many a man who might have made a good blacksmith or barman may be turned into a sailor. The situation is so absurd that it does not bear thinking about, except as a game. The military aristocracies who treat preparation for war as a form of sport are in this entirely logical. On the other hand, when the Burgess fulminates against war as though it were the only example of wasted human energy that does not bear thinking of, he is shutting his eyes to the fact that the whole of modern civilization is built upon a foundation of waste, where it is not built upon a foundation of want. Our estimates of men and nations rise and fall with their capacity for waste. The great nation, in the eyes of the imperialist, is the nation that can waste the world. It is the nation that can mow down harvests of savages without even the comparatively decent excuse that it wants to eat them. 
it is the nation that can make the genius of other nations as though it were not that can ruin harbors and send ships worth a million pounds to the bottom of the sea i do not say that there are not other elements that have a part in the greatness of nations but the power of destruction alone is enough to make any nation supreme for a day and the supremacy of no nation lasts much longer and remembered in history similarly with individual men and women everybody said emerson loves a lover it would be almost truer to say that everybody loves a wastrel in our boyhood we love those who waste themselves in our discreeter years we envy those who can waste the lives of others it has often been noticed that youths and maidens have a tenderness for drunkards and rakes they reverence the genius of life wasted almost more than the genius of life fulfilled byron whose vices killed him in his thirties sidney carton who was seldom sober mr kipling's gentlemen rankers damned from here to eternity these awake a passionate devotion in the breasts of the young such as is never lavished on successful grocers it is the prodigal son and not his respectable brother at whom affectionate eyes look round as he passes along the street perhaps it is because he is so much more obviously trying a fall with destiny than the grocer the mark of doom makes a more picturesque effect on the brow than a silk-lined bowler hat according to this view the wastrel owes his appeal largely to the fact that he is a fighter in a lost cause the cause of those who have lifted hands against the universe the reverence of middle age for the wealthier geniuses of waste however cannot be explained on grounds like these one does not think of lord tomnoddy or sir alexander soapsuds as a warrior against destiny the prodigality of the rich appeals to us for quite other reasons than does the prodigality of the prodigal we endure it chiefly because we envy it the dream of being a rich man who can thrust out men and women from their homes to make room for pheasants who by sheer economic pressure can force us to make bonbons for his guests when we ought to be making boots for ourselves who can take a man who might be a duke and turn him into a flunky lulls us into a kind of satisfaction with the world the man who has the power to waste fields and men and women and money and labor is the king who rules in every vulgar heart among us his royal wastefulness in food and servants and ornaments brings him it may be granted not a teaspoonful of added health or an egg cupful more of happiness even the poets who have so often sung for rich masters have always had the grace to warn them that overeating and overdrinking and overconfidence in this world's goods was merely three death's heads dressed up in seductive bonnets but the truth is we never believe the poets when once we have laid down the book our ideal of wastefulness is firmly rooted in us beyond the attacks of any asphete with his harmless little quiver of phrases even when we are not rich ourselves we can imitate the rich in their wastefulness there is nothing the average servant scorns more than the house in which she is expected to make use of the torsos of loaves and in which she is forbidden to sacrifice odds and ends of meat to the little gods of the dustbin she loves the house where there is milk for the sink as well as for the children and the cat years ago when some people were advocating a tax on salt they did so on the ground that no one needs suffer since at present everybody puts on his plate several times as much salt as he ever uses hence if we were more careful with the salt such a tax would be a tax not on salt but on wastefulness it is the same with mustard 
i remember a scotsman once asking me in a hushed voice if i knew how coleman had made his fortune i thought from my friend's solemn air that it must have been in some sensational way by buying a deserted gold mine or running a south american revolution but my friend merely pointed to the plate from which i was eating he made it he declared solemnly out of mustard you leave on the edge of your plate perhaps the scotsman was right in shaking his head so gravely over our extravagance in mustard but somehow i too have the kitchen's taste for superfluities and enough never seems half so good as a little more horace described the happy man as the man who had enough and something over for servants and thieves oh the little more and how much it is even if we grudge it to the thieves we love it because of the sense it gives us that we are no longer struggling in the water but sitting in triumph over the dry land the average englishman dislikes tariff reform not entirely because he has grasped the economics of the subject but because it would bring him in a system which would compel him to be as thrifty as a frenchman and as careful as a german one must admit to a certain degree of sympathy with him when one hears of french peasants as once i did calling round after the meals of the rich to carry off the scrapings of the plates to make soup for their families and of their doing this not because they were very poor because they were very thrifty one's heart suddenly rejoices at the sight of the tattered old flag of prodigality again one does not want to see thrift given the extreme character of an orgy on the other hand a good many of us get an easy sense of the heroic by living in lordly wastefulness it appeals to us as a kind of enlargement of our personality that is why so many of us shrink with horror from such social economies as a kitchen or heating apparatus that would serve a street we like our own fires and our own bad cookery it is as childish as if we wanted our own footpath and our own moon and no doubt we would insist on these if we could we pretend that romance would leave the world if the sausages were turned by a citizen in a municipal cap of liberty instead of by a wage slave and that freedom would be dead if we warmed our toes at a civic fire i wonder that no one takes exception to the communal warmth of the sun the present wastefulness would be little worse than an insane joke if all this multiplying of cooks and parlour-maids did not absorb such an amount of reluctant youth and deftness and energy but alas our ideals of private citizenship seldom mean that we do our work privately ourselves they only mean that we privately hire somebody else to do it in other words they are usually a violation of the private citizenship of somebody else consequently though we enjoy helping in the wastefulness of it all as a puppy enjoys tearing a book we do not feel justified in elevating our tastes into an ethical system we are simply grabbers of the corn supply probably even in a hundred years people will look back on our present west european society and marvel at the common habit of prosperous men in sitting down to a table where there are far more dishes and elegancies than they could ever absorb while men women and children walk the streets empty i seldom sit down to dinner in a hotel without a sense that i am being offered three people's food no a society that gives three people's food to one man and one man's portion of food or less to three people must be the laughing stock of angels the social waste that results from railway monopolies and battleship programs and the warren of small shops in every city is as nothing to this except perhaps in so far as it is the cause of this on the whole however the problem of waste goes deeper than battleships which are but toys and which will disappear as soon as the nations grow up and cease making faces at each other it is a problem on the same level with lust 
which indeed is a form of waste it is one of the great problems of egoism which is more concerned with mastery than with truth or common sense or gentleness not mastery of oneself just gimcrack made in birmingham mastery this is the mammon of our conceit upon whose altars we are willing to offer up the sacrifice of the wasted earth End of section 10.